Good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the second in our series of financial advisor uh, training program. Uh, so just some basic housekeeping before we begin. We would allow questions at the end of the session. So please use the chat function on Zoom to ask any questions. Uh, you'll receive a copy of the presentation after the session. It'll be posted also to the Anchor YouTube channel. As this is the end of the CPD cycle, the CPDs will count for the next year's cycle. When I thought about doing these sessions, uh, the idea was to solve some of the real issues that financial advisors have. One of the biggest issues that advisors often struggle with is what I term big case -alitis. That's when you have an opportunity to present to a massively wealthy client who, if you would get it, would be life-changing for your practice. More often than not, these deals do not come off for financial advisors and waste an enormous amount of time hunting whales with the wrong fishing gear. One of the most common requests I get from financial advisors is, Dale, I have a 100 million rand client. Please, can you get Peter to come with me to the client? Of course, the answer from Pete is always yes, but something amazing happens. Every time he seems to go, he comes back with a new client. He also has happy clients. So I've asked him today to share some of his secrets that he's acquired over the years in dealing with super ultra high net worth clients. A bit more about Peter before we begin. Peter's a CA with 25 years experience in global financial markets. He's worked as an analyst. He's been the head of research and chief investment office at a number of SA's top financial institutions. Peter's been rated the top investment analyst for Financial Mail a record 21 times. He founded Anchor Group in 2011. He's currently the CEO of Anchor Group and the co-CIO of Anchor Asset Management. He has taken the group to over 65 billion rand in assets and deal with some of South Africa's wealthiest clients. And with that, I'd like to hand over to Peter. Okay, hi folks. It's great to have you all there. Um, hopefully we're getting to somewhere near the end of this coronavirus madness. And my 19 year old son this morning reminded me that coronavirus is a time when the youngsters are begging the old people to stay at home and not vice versa. So today we're going to um, go through quite an interesting topic. It took a lot of uh, kind of thinking and reflection to, to answer the question. But it's, uh, as, as Dale says, the, I'm a male, so I'm difficult to do two things at once. Let's get this on the screen. Um, <clears throat> Peter, just to interrupt you for a second, you're a little bit soft. If you could please speak up. Okay. So the, um, in, in, a, in the life of a financial advisor, there's often one or two or three clients that can literally be life-changing. And um, my background as an investment professional goes back to running the investment side of Investec Wealth um, and then starting Anchor about eight years ago. In both of those businesses, we spent a lot of time um, accumulating some, some large clients. In Anchor Capital at the moment, we did a cult the other day, we've got um, 91 clients with over 150 million rand with us. So I think we've, we've learned the skills and uh, protocol for, for dealing with large amounts of money. And of those 91 clients, I'd guess about half of them are people that we do with financial advisors. So we're a small player in the market. We're probably only 1% of the market. Um, and we like to work with people. And I guess what differentiates Anchor is we've got an investment team and process behind it, which um, works with financial advisors to service clients. So, you know, if you come to us with a client, he's your client, and we look to see where we can add value. Just to talk about Anchor as a, as a business, I'm not going to spend too much time on this because I think a lot of you um, would have seen this slide a few times. We've now changed how we describe our assets in dollars and not rands. So we've got about $3.8 billion of assets. It's about 65 billion rand. It's uh, quite disconcerting how when you divide 65 by 16.7, the number gets quite small. And we've, we've got an investment process and team with about 20 investment professionals covering asset classes both locally and globally. Right, so let's, let's get straight into the hunting whale story. And this is really about acquiring, forming a relationship and providing a service to a big client. Um, in, in our terms, we would consider a whale with anybody more than 50 million rand of investable assets. But ultimately, what we get constantly amazed by is the number of people out there who've got hundreds of millions of rands of investment assets. And I wanted to share a little bit of the experience we've had in dealing with these people and um, in providing them with services. 
I think the first point to make, and I often, often make it to, to the guys in our business, is the most daunting and least inviting are, are the best potential clients. What I mean by that, somebody is very inviting, happy to have a meeting with you, um, happy to share everything with you. You'll probably find that they're doing that with 10 other people at the same time. And some of our, uh, some of our relationships which have flourished the most are ones where the guys are skeptical at first, you don't get a great feeling from the first meeting, um, because it's their money, and they guard it quite jealously, as, as, as they rightfully should. And those are the people that people tend not to try and get a second meeting with. And often the effort put into those clients have the best results. Then also the point that everybody wants to hear a new investment idea. If somebody's with Investec, PSG, Nedbank, etc., they're typically being presented with the product ideas from their house. You know, and it's certainly particularly the insurance companies and the banks. So, you know, the two big financial institutions that I've worked, worked with, um, worked for. The restrictions and the limits were often who could only present the products of that house. If you've got an, an interesting investment idea or something that can make somebody some money, and particularly people with a high level of liquidity, if you can present them with something that'll make them money, they're always prepared to listen. And sitting where you sit as an independent financial advisor, you can look right across the market at all kinds of ideas and present the one that works. Um, we, we've partnered with a guy called Brian Hirsch, who most of you will be, be familiar with. Um, he's probably one of the most celebrated financial advisors out there in the market. And well into his 70, he's been doing it for 50 years. And he loves telling the story how at the age of 23, um, he found up Donald Gordon and got him to buy a Liberty policy. And he's still got a copy of that policy. So who on earth would have thought that um, you could sell a liberty policy to Donald Gordon, but nobody had ever tried. So he had the gumption to proceed with it and, and go for it. The second point is, if you're going to go hunting, and this is more of a kind of a, a wildlife analogy rather than a whale itself, take a ranger with you. Um, I think what we love doing is, is when a financial advisor has identified a big AUM client opportunity, we often accompany them, and we are, we are able to offer a different realm of products, services, ideas and across our base. You know, we've got a base of 16,000 clients, so we've seen most scenarios at some point in time. And, you know, don't just use us. If one looks at it objectively, um, you know, look across and see who's best at what they do. We've also found that segregated portfolios are a very attractive and core service that we offer. Somebody with a high level of wealth um, typically is much more interested in their, in their investments. They're closer to their investments and they like the fact that they own some Apple shares or some Google shares. Um, I constantly have conversations with high net worth individuals where they're particularly chuffed about, you know, the call in Spotify that went from $140 to $280. And often it's not just about, um, you know, the composite all in return they're getting every year. Um, but the, the little wins that they're making on shares. And one of the most effective pitches we've had, we've had when working with financial advisors is actually talking about specific shares, getting them interested in the share market. And I say this particularly in the global context. You know, we'll move on to the fact that um, whales are typically global citizens. Um, at our business, we offer a very high level of service and, um, and research capability over specific shares. We put out a lot of content and, and typically our high net worth individual clients are getting commentary on shares every day out of the market at a standard that I would like to feel is, is with the best out there. The second point is simply to ask for business. Um, one of the most phenomenal things that I've experienced is, you know, often our wealth advisors internally in our business, um, you know, I think of specific instances where a send statement comes out, somebody sold a business it's quite clear that, they've, um, that they're going to earn a significant amount of money out of, out of a transaction. And we go and see them and we say, you know, kind of who else are we pitching against and who else has come to see them? And very often there's nobody else. People think that, um, you know, the level of client is, is, is too big and inevitably they'll have Investec and PSG and everybody all over them. We're quite surprised often about how, you know, I'm not sure lazy is the right term, but reticent financial advisors and the like are to, to actually approach and ask for business. The next um, mantra that we always have in, in, in our business is, is identifying problems and solving them. 
And often the simple question posed to somebody, you know, how are you feeling about your current investments? Or where are your problems? Um, you know, how is your exposure? Um, that enables you to identify what the problems are. And once you know what the problems are, working with, with us or with another player in the market can help solve them. We also see a trend um, with Wales moving from wealth creation to wealth, pre wealth preservation. You know, a client who's uh, got 10 million rand and desperately needs to get a 15% return per annum is a very different equation uh, to a really high net worth individual who, you know, has got a billion rand of investable assets and a 6% low risk return, you know, results in a massive absolute amount of money every year. And our feeling is, and our experience is, you can do some form of business with 90% of the people that you get a meeting with. It might be a different type of business to what you anticipated or wanted, but I can guarantee you that almost every whale that you go to see, um, so there's something that you've got or something that you'll know that will appeal to them or solves a problem that somebody else isn't. We find a lot of high net worth individuals have got old portfolios, you know, a, a big tranche of NASPERS shares, a big tranche of Remgro shares. They're too scared to sell them because of the capital gains tax implications. Um, and often, you know, nobody showed them the sums of changing the portfolio a little bit, um, perhaps doing a section 42 transfer of some shares into a unit trust, you know, lots of different options out there depending on their specific circumstances. And, giving them the opportunity and showing them visibly the options that they have. And often they don't realize or haven't properly considered, largely for emotional reasons, the options that they have and what the result would be. So then we get to the question, you know, who is a whale? Um, I've, I've got a, a friend of mine who um, sold a buffalo for 168 million rand. Uh, I actually, when, when I tell people the story, the... Um, I actually go and pull this, the story off the internet because it sounds unbelievable. But the whale is somebody who made some money. And when you get to meet them and interact with them, and many of you will have big clients, they're often people just like you and me, but they happen to have a good business idea and they compounded wealth with property. I remember when I was at Investec Wealth, and we kind of did a, we looked across our top 200 clients and about 100 of them had made their money by the compounding effect of, of property. And that's because in property, you tend not to have a bad year. And, you know, if every year you can produce 5 to 15%, the impact over a time period is phenomenal. They could have hit the resource boom. We've got a lot of uh, high net worth clients. You know, typically it's a boom or bust type industry, but guys who are exposed to the resource industry when it's booming, you know, profits can go up three or four or five times. And if they exit at the right time, there's, there's a lot to be earned. They sold some buffalo or they inherited money in trusts. I would estimate, I mean, I guess typically our business is, is fairly young. Uh, I, I would guess that probably 80% of the big clients that we, we work with, with IFAs or not, um, the money they've actually made themselves. And I constantly get amazed, particularly when you go down to Springs and Benoni and those big industrial areas inside some factories, they're, they're, they're guys turning the power on and making a significant amount of money. So that... Very few of them are actually from the financial market. Um, so one thing you know for sure is you, they don't have more investment knowledge than you. Because they've got money, they typically research quite a lot, but they certainly don't have the breadth of experience <clears throat> and have the full range of, of investment opportunities that you can provide to them. They don't know about every investment opportunity. And that's why you know, one of the approaches that we've got when we think something looks particularly attractive, whether it be a share or an asset class, um, or a specific fund. Um, you know, we take it out to people, and we've built up a base of, of current clients and future clients, potential clients, and many of those with financial advisors. We've had some meetings with them. We understand what's attractive to them. We understand what their problems are. And often it's only six or 12 months later when you find something where the kind of, um, the light goes up and you go, that, that's appropriate for that particular client. And they often get less attention than you think and often in, underserviced by the incumbents. A lot of, and this particularly pertains to the really big investment houses, a lot of them with big uh, segregated portfolios where, you know, a portfolio manager has been sitting there and his view is that that client's never going to sell that share. So he's not getting the service, not getting the ideas and simply keeping in somebody's email inbox or sending them a WhatsApp with an idea or an observation can certainly pay off. 
I then tried to do some research and I've seen lots of different versions of this, of you know, how many whales there are out there. There was an Afrasia Bank report uh, towards the end of last year, which said that South Africa had 39,200 people with assets of more than 14 million rand, 2,000 with assets of more than 140 million, and 95 people with assets of more than 1.42 billion. So in my view, it's, I, I think it's almost impossible to calculate these numbers. And my assessment of it is that is vastly underestimated. And, you know, if you take those numbers, that would mean that we've got 20% market share. And I don't think we've got even 2 or 3% market share. And as I said, I get constantly amazed when you, you know, people open their books and they show you their investment portfolio. There's absolutely no way that that would find its way into these kind of surveys. So it's a big market out there. A lot of people have made a lot of money in South Africa. And I think over the course of the next two or three years, there's a lot of anxiety about South Africa and lots of transactions going on. And all of those transactions give opportunities. So how do you find them? Um, I think the, the best case is obviously a referral. Um, and you can ask people for referrals. Um, referrals often come unsolicited, and that's obviously the most valuable one. Um, number two is transactions. So, so we keep a careful eye on send statements. We keep our uh, ear to the ground in terms of businesses that are transacting. And, you know, I, I'll say to our guys back at the office, typically in somebody's life, there's probably three or four times or occasions when they get a big lump of money or an, or an opportunity to realign or invest for the first time a lump of money. And staying in contact with people along that continuum and being there and making sure that they're aware who you are when that happens is kind of key. Obviously, retirement is one. We're experiencing... Um, Quite a lot of clients coming through financial advisors with retrenchments that have gone on, particularly in state-owned enterprises. Um, so sniffing around. And for those of you who know some of the guys in our business, there's, there's a high level of, of hunger and cold calling. And that, that requires a special kind of person. I, you know, I think probably only one in a thousand people are, are good at cold calling. Um, but you know, for, for the guys who are comfortable with it, that can often give some results that are unexpected. And, and lastly, persevere. You know, the, we, we've got a guy in our business who often comes to me to say he's brought on a client, um, and I remember meeting him with the client you know, one or two or three years ago. But just some constant contact, um, an email once a month with pertinent, valuable information that you know um, relates to that client. And, you know, I always say to him, if I wanted a meeting with the president, I'd certainly use this particular individual in our business. Um, Right, then how do you service a, a, a whale? I think the, the, the key point is when we get to look at these guys for the first time, they typically are paying too much money. And small percentages on large amounts of money are actually massive quantums. And we often use a technique, you know, and in fact, I've just been in a meeting now with a client who said there's a platform fee of, of 40 basis points. So it's only 0.4. You put, you know, when you round that up and quantify that in RAND terms, it's a massive amount of money. So while platforms are, are crucial and very valuable for financial advisors for, for the normal client, if you can take some costs out of the guy's life, um, it certainly does make a lot of sense. I think also to realize the point that they're going to have other advisors, um, there's typically five or six or seven different aspects of somebody's money that needs attention from trust to wills to tax to investment to property. And what we found to be most effective is to be the most accessible, um, to, you know, to return a call quickly, to email quickly, and to proactively send uh, appropriate information. And we've had feedback from a lot of our clients that we're the most accessible of the people that they deal with. Also, don't try and be everything to everybody. Um, if you can get yourself into the role of being a facilitator, um, admitting something is not your area of expertise, bringing in an appropriate expert. Um, certainly in our world, we're not tax experts, <clears throat> but we certainly do work with, I, I think, the best tax guys out there. So we'll take those people to them. And often understanding who's appropriate to who. Contact, ac ac accessibility. WhatsApp, we found, is a, <clears throat> is a particularly good and effective mechanism. Um, perhaps with some clients, you kind of have to make it client-specific. But the thing that we like about digital communication and WhatsApp in particular is the asynchronous nature. So phoning somebody, 
there's probably a 10% chance that it's an appropriate time um, for them to speak to you. A WhatsApp or an email can be read um, kind of in, in their living room at the time that they want to. Sending relevant material we've talked about and offshore service. You know, I think what's become increasingly important in, in, in high net worth clients' lives is the comfort that, you know, we always use the phrase from a South African perspective, live in the sun and invest in the shade. And so enjoy and benefit from, from, you know, kind of what you can experience in South Africa, but have your money offshore, um, live in the comfort that a weakening rand makes you kind of richer and not poorer, and making sure that uh, you provide that service. I think the, one of the frustrations we certainly have is with any South African business, you know, I can kind of phone the CEO of the business in, in, in get hold of him and with a one hour time period, we can get action, you know, we can go to where the action is. With offshore businesses, it kind of seems like a bit of a black hole and it's difficult to find exactly who to speak to. Um, so, so what we've done is backed some specific people overseas, worked on those relationships, made sure that we're an important client to them. So when they get a request from us, that that happens. What we've also found, things that happen in South Africa in one or two or three days can often take two weeks to happen offshore. And being honest and transparent in giving people updates on what's happening is crucial. So, you know, if transferring some money from one fund to another is going to take a six-day period, prepare your client for that, inform them every day where it is in the process, because there's nothing worse than silence or not knowing and we, I find certainly a lot of our wealth advisors um, are too nervous to tell a client if there's bad news. If there is, tell them straight away, get it, get it over and done with, and more importantly, tell them what you're going to do about it. And that boils down to honest, immediate feedback, um, especially of bad news. I find um, I've got a tendency myself, when things are going really well, you want to send the client their returns, um, their returns every day. You know, the, we've had a fantastic time in offshore markets this year. A global equity fund, I think, is up about 45% in dollars. And, you know, when, when you're making clients money, there's no, better, there's no better feeling. And there's a kind of a deep desire to communicate that to clients. Um, but just remember, if you do that, they're going to expect the same level when the market's going down. So perhaps restrain yourself, keep yourself to the month, um, month-on-month report. You know, perhaps just send them a WhatsApp or, or a call on a particular aspect. Um, but remember, there's good times and bad times. And probably most important of all, treat your money, treat their money like your own. Um, you know, if you picture you've got an offshore portfolio, you want to know what's happening. If there's some big or bad news offshore, you want to know what the impact is, you're going to go and look at your portfolio again. So put yourself in their shoes and preempt what they'll be thinking. And what they'll be thinking, it's very, very simple. Put yourself, you know, just pretend that that's your money out there. Then importantly, whales have problems too. And, you know, the mantra is solve a problem rather than sell a product. Um, If you go to a client, identify what his problem is and present him with a solution, that will have a much higher success rate than going and saying, you know, I've got a fantastic fund that will do very well. Because we all know that the stars of today can have a tough time over the next 12 months. And the, the mantra is really pain points, what keeps you up at night? The problem right now, um, and there aren't easy solutions, is certainly um, from an offshore perspective, there's low returns out there other than equity. It's one of the reasons that equity is doing so well. If you're not in the equity market, um, you know, you're going to get a 1% or 2% return. Uh, we've got quite a few solutions to that. Um, obviously, the moment that you're trying to get that 3 4 5 6% dollar return offshore, <clears throat> other than equity, there are different levels of risk. Um, but if you're looking for ideas on that, and we can certainly w- work with you to provide your clients with solutions. Another big point is the whales often don't know what their problem is. Um, I've got a slide coming up talking about diversification and um, exposure to the world growth sectors. I find that particularly old money is invested in old sectors. Uh, you know, the tech sector is now up to 35% of world markets. If you go back to two or three years ago, tech was considered almost a niche sector in many instances, and people felt very anxious to invest in it. Um, so, the, you know, their portfolios were full of British American tobacco and Unilever and J&J, and they've done half or a third of the return that they would have done in something with a bit more of a tech focus. 
And what I love in our business, you know, I'm, I'm into my 50s now and kind of stayed in terms of the way I think and the way I evaluate things. So I place a huge emphasis on youngsters coming through and I listen to the way they talk and the way they think and they do think differently. And often hearing those perspectives can result in a much better investment return. In our business, um, you know, we, we've got quite a few youngsters who are very tech savvy, tech savvy and a CEO who can do some programming is invaluable. Um, you know, they can see the, the growth potential, they can see the behavior of teenagers, they can see what's driving businesses around the world. And that, that's got us to put together a tech unit about two years ago. We launched a global tech fund about a year ago. And as you all know, that's been an absolutely fantastic timing. Many, many, many high net worth individuals haven't properly thought about estate duty and CITUS. CITUS is the tax that you're liable for if you have a segregated portfolio in a developed market. Um, I'm, I'm sure most of you know the details of it, but that's pretty scary. Um, and many clients that we meet or potential clients aren't aware um, of, of what happens in the event of their death. Or certainly they might be aware of it, but haven't planned properly for it. An essential mindset is that a whale is a global citizen. And in broad terms, if I was to pick a number, South Africa shouldn't be more than 20% 20, 20 of the net asset value. You know, if you put South Africa in context, you often hear these statistics, but we're now 0.7% of the world. And not so much for South African reasons and currency reasons, but probably the biggest reason to have global exposure is that you simply can't get exposure to many sectors outside of South Africa. Our only exposure is to, uh, to the tech sector is through NASPAS, and it certainly makes good sense to be um, diversified out of that. In South Africa at the moment, um, yield is very, very attractive. So it's impossible to get a yield elsewhere. And um, we've got a lot of hard net worth clients in the moment in our flexible income fund and our bond fund. Um, we've got some very rare and exclusive access to, to the Hollard Endowment um, where clients don't pay any income tax, don't pay any capital gains tax. They do pay dividend tax. That old assessed loss story in the endowments is running out quite quickly. Um, you know, we've still got plenty of capacity to work with financial advisors to put their clients into an opportunity where they can earn cash. So in that Hollard endowment, guys can invest money into it and we can put them in our flexible income fund earning six and a half, seven percent. And so less one percent, they're getting a five to six percent return off the tax. In our bond fund, they're getting an eight percent, eight and a half percent return off the tax. Uh, and then in, within that endowment, we can asset swap the money offshore. So we, we're sitting with quite a few clients in the position where they think that equities have run quite hard. They're sitting earning South African yield, and it's amongst the highest re, uh, real yield in the world. And at below 16 to the currency, with staying in that endowment with the same tax advantages, they're then going to asset swap it into, into international assets. The RAND is always a big issue. Um, I think the you know, con concern about the currency often results in people not moving and losing opportunities. Um, we like to encourage people to, sh to follow a fairly consistent transfer of cash offshore for high net worth individuals to diversify their portfolios. Everybody's always waiting for that next 50 cents. Our fundamental view at the moment is we think the currency will come back to 16 to 1650. But probably the, the most important view is that the RAND consistently devalues by 4 to 6% per annum and has over almost any 10-year time period if you look back over the last 50 years. If you extrapolate that from today, the RAND will be in the 25 to 30 RAND range in 2030. Now, if you take that into context, trying to be too clever to time 1680 or 1660 and then missing the opportunities, obviously very expensive over the longer term. It's also, you know, pretty obvious where the returns have been over the last five years. Global equities have given you 15.5% um, per annum in rands, uh, local equities 4.3. And having these simple return tables makes it a lot easier to convince a client where their money should be. If we look at the South African equity market, it's effectively a low growth play on emerging markets. And when looking at somebody's portfolio, it's important for them to understand what they invested in in the South African market. And it's really a tiny market with a small pool of concentrated shares driven almost exclusively by emerging markets and dominated by low growth SA businesses with declining returns. And for many of them, it's not that cheap right now. 
we do still see uh, opportunities, which are shorter term opportunities consistently on the SA market. We know it exceptionally well. We've got a nice team um, looking at the markets. But if you to look at an overall portfolio over a 10 year period, or a really high net worth individual, in South Africa, the drivers are 44% SA, 42% emerging markets, and only 5% driven by developed markets. So SA is a reasonable place to keep emerging market exposure, the likes of NASPAS, the commodity companies, et cetera. Um, so there are segments of the SA market. When I talk about this, I talk about it as a whole. Um, and, but you, know, you, you also want to have some liquidity available. There are times that the SA market is going to do reasonably well. Um, this is just a slide we've done. I'm not going to go through in, in a huge amount of detail, but we've taken the economic drivers of the SA market, so SA financials, NASPAS, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and then our base case annual earnings growth expectations over the course of the next five years um, with a comment. And there we get to a composite a scenario of a bear case of 1% earnings growth and a bull case of 10.5%. There are some sectors which offer some much more exciting opportunities. So I think you have to be quite specific where you want to be invested in, in the South African market. But the base case is not particularly exciting. And then very importantly, you know, the world has definitely changed over the course of the last three or four months. Uh, I think of the CEO of, of Microsoft indicating that the future has been brought forward by two years. E-commerce is the most dramatic with uh, Shopify, which is now the biggest market cap company on the Canadian exchange. The CEO of that business, and that's really kind of a, um, an e-commerce retailing platform for people to sell products on. And they've recently part partnered with Facebook. They reckon they're doing the monthly turnover now that they were anticipating doing in 2030. What this graph on the left-hand side shows um, Relative to 2019 or the beginning of 2020, earnings expectations for the whole S&P went down 36%, and the expectations for two years' time are now 10% higher than they were two years ago. But within that, information, technology, and healthcare, companies are now expected to make 30% more in 2022 relative to what people expected six months ago. So their futures really have been brought forward, and one has to really relook at people's investment portfolios. We're looking at all of our portfolios. The world is a very different place to what it was in only January this year. And obviously, the key point is very little way to leverage off that in South Africa. There's no way to get exposure to big pharma and the whole healthcare sector. And there's only NASPAS in terms of exposure to the information technology sector. And this is a graph that's come out in, in quite a few places, but I think hugely compelling. E-commerce penetration gradually going up by 1% or 2% a year for the last 10 years, and then up by 11%, so 10 years growth um, over the course of the last 8 to 12 weeks. Another huge point is a massive amount of money in South Africa sits in NASPAS. A fantastic business. We back it. We like it. We've got 16% exposure to it in our equity fund. But it certainly does make a lot more sense. You know, we saw recent to have a portfolio of these businesses. And that's one of the reasons that we launched our tech fund a year ago, um, is there's some fantastic um, investment opportunities out there. We've seen recently that individual companies can have their own specific risks. You know, so Trump having a go at the Chinese companies, um, if that's, you know, the, the, you could eventually face the eventuality where American fund managers aren't able to own these Chinese companies. So certainly having exposure across the spectrum, we think makes a hell of a lot more sense. And the Global Tech Fund has outperformed NASPAS um, by, and depending on when you measure it, by 10 to 20% since we did this investment. And NASPAS itself has underperformed 10 cent by 22% year to date. So it's been a much better play to have a portfolio of these companies then people often don't know what to do about you know, high net worth clients and fees. Um, I, I think you'd be really surprised how many are still paying very high fees. Um, and, and we kind of put high net worth clients into two buckets, those who are very fee sensitive and those who actually have no idea what fees they're paying. And there's a lot of guys out there, and particularly brokerage rates, <clears throat> when they're sitting with old historic portfolios with the older stock breaking companies. 
uh, often on sliding sliding scales from a brokerage point of view where they're paying one, one and a half percent brokerage. Um, and often just helping a high net worth client understand the level of fees that they're paying becomes crucially important. Um, just kind of talking around, you know, I'm more on the asset management side than dealing directly with these guys on a day-to-day basis, but chatting to our wealth managers and the general feedback is clients below 10 million rand, there's, there's very little fee pressure. Um, you know, I know the financial advisors out there, the average is a 50 basis point advice fee and they're then paying full asset management fees. We typically experience in the 20 to 50 million rand category, uh, people are looking for some discount because of size. Um, and certainly you can help them find discounts and you can negotiate with asset managers when you get to a certain size um, and, and you know, discount your own fee to the extent that you're willing to do so. Above 50 million or so, um, you know, and, and I've actually talked to a lot of financial advisors who say they don't really want to deal with clients in, in excess of 50 million rand because the complexity um, increases and the fee sensitivity increases dramatically. Above 50 million, we get clients wanting, you know, kind of fees to half. Uh, but, you know, if you're looking after a client with 100 or 200 million rand, the absolute amount of money that you're charging, them, that does make sense. I think also, you know, there's, there's, there's conventions out there from a South African perspective. Um, the whole market's moved away from performance fees. Hedge funds have been out of favor. But when you get up into this high net worth category, we find that, in fact, and we ask clients what they'd like. Um, we find a lot of clients are very happy to say, you know, they don't like paying fees, but if you make them money, they're happy to share their money with you. So in our experience, about 30% of clients, um, you know, if they, they're looking to make a 5 or 10% dollar return, and if, you know, if you can do better than that for them, and there's a strong willingness, we find, uh, to participate in that. But I think above all else, it's not about fees, it's about value. Um, and if you make money for a client, give them a great service experience, present them with ideas that they're not seeing elsewhere, um, your reflection of, of what's happening out there, um, that really is what represents value. Then you really have, and this is kind of a key passion of mine, you've got to beg them to diversify. I've been absolutely horrified over the course of my career um, where we've seen really wealthy people get destroyed and their fam- family wealth destroyed by simply being in one asset. Um, you know, we've got obviously lots of examples in Steinhoff. Um, the key point is that the unexpected can and does happen to any investment. And having more than 20% of your money in any one share, no matter how promising it looks, um, is, is just too much risk to take. Um, lots of guys who were in love with Steinhoff, um, you know, I've seen people's NAV go down by 70% because of that share. And um, Sassel's obviously been a disaster. And we dealt with a lot of former Sassel directors who, you know, just believed that there's a huge amount of passion, particularly where there's been a family association or people have worked for a business themselves. And they really can't look at it unemotionally. And if you do find a client like this, I mean, I, I often say to these kind of guys, I don't care if you do business with us, just, just listen. We've actually got a presentation that we put together giving some specific no-names examples of people who are in shares and, and you know, kind of what's happened to them. CAP is another example. African Bank, um, you know, we had an ex-director who we, we literally begged for, for, for a year or two to diversify out of African Bank and subsequently lost all of his wealth. NASPAS, which has been the biggest value creator on the South African market over the course of the last 10 years, as you all know. In fact, I was looking at, in my office the other day, I wrote, I've got a report that I wrote on NASPAS at 78 rand a share. Um, I remember writing one at 15 rand a share and getting a handwritten thank you letter from Ton Fosler. Um, but NASPAS has, has been terrible from a, from a relative perspective. You know, you could have taken that ex- exposure, diversified it into, into the global sector, and, and you'd be up 20 to 30%. So that's, a, you know, kind of a key mantra of ours. And if you want anybody to be convinced on that, we're more than happy to do that. And then I, very importantly, you know, what, what I've tried to convey is these high net worth individuals are, are individuals and people like all of us. Um, often when you meet them, you're surprised at, at their humility or just what ordinary people they are. And to understand that at most they spend 10% of their time in the market. You spend 100% of your time in the market. And feel free to leverage off us. We've got 20 brand boxes who spend 100% of their time in the market. That gives you 2,000%. So the, you know, the key point is 
you do have more expertise than them, but it's about identifying what their problems are and, and giving them the solutions to that. And then the other point is, is Wales come back. Uh, you know, we've certainly experienced with financial advisors and, and with direct clients, um, guys, you know, kind of falling out of love with you or wanting to have other exposure or thinking that somebody else is better at something. And I, I would say, you know, we've probably in the, in the short life of our business experienced five or six big clients like that and three or four have come back for a certain aspect or because we know how they think and when a particular investment opportunity comes around, we know that um, that resonates with them and we take it back to them. And then hold hands with the experts. Um, you know, so provide solutions in tandem with high quality experts. If you want uh, segregated portfolios, hold hands with us. You know, we, we, have, we have a great way of operating with financial advisors to run those kind of portfolios. Um, with trusts, you know, uh, we hold hands with trust experts. We take responsibility for trust, but we don't pretend to be the experts. Tax that we've talked about. There are different opportunities available for Wales. And that's another key point when I went, when I went back to platforms. Don't put them in your kind of common channel and deal with them in the same manner as you would uh, with a one to 10 million rand client. And to give you some examples, all of this is kind of words and, and pretty pictures and, and slides. Um, but some specific examples of things we've done with people over the course of the last year or two. A lot of people stuck with high concentration, low base cost SA equities. Um, and particularly when share prices are low, that's a fantastic opportunity um, for somebody to, to do a section 42 into a unit trust where the base cost is then at a low level um, and they're decreasing their future tax liability. Um, Many, many high net worth individuals have got big tranches of shares and they don't want to sell them because of capital gains tax. So this really does provide a solution. Um, they, obviously their key um, objective has got to be diversification of a portfolio. And um, if they're doing it just for tax purposes, then, then you're going to raise some eyebrows. So you know, one's got to be very delicate and specific and follow the rules. We, we talked to a, to a, with a financial advisor to a high net worth individual the other day, and the opportunity there was his company pension fund. Um, you know, they, they worked out they hadn't made great returns, they were paying way too much. And, you know, often in that entrepreneurial type business, there's a fairly small pension fund, there's a 30 to 50 million rand pension fund. Those guys simply don't get attention from the big guys. And often that's a great way into a high net worth opportunity where if you can provide him with a, a solution to his pension fund, get him service that he's simply not getting at that level of pension fund, it's often the way into his, his, his kind of personal wallet. Um, we found a lot of people where risk appetite is very low. The market had crashed or the market's already jumped too fast. There's no yield offshore. Um, we've put billions of rands over the course of the last year or two into the Hollard Endowment, into SA Yield. So... Our flexible income fund is now over 5 billion rand in size, um, producing consistent results month in, month out. Month out. And to offer a person a, a very, very secure after-tax 6% yield um, is, is quite compelling at the moment in the South African context. A lot of people, I mean, I'm constantly amazed where you know, high net worth individuals don't have enough offshore exposure. Um, asset swap it out. Um, one can put in the whole out endowment and then asset swap it out. There's lots of different options. And simply providing, and you know, people also, they place a huge value on not having the administration aspect. And if you can take that out of their hands, um, assure them that it's going to be admin free. Um, you often just get handed the business across the table. People paying too much, in South, too much tax in South Africa. Um, there's various solutions depending on their scenario. Again, the whole out endowment has come through. And, um, you know, I talked about challenging SA convention. Hedge funds have uh, gone out of favor in the financial advisor community, or not that they really were, were ever in South Africa. But I think financial advisors often forget um, that hedge funds are a great product internationally. And if you look at the big foundations and the big family offices in Europe and America, they typically have between 5 and 30% in hedge funds. Because the right hedge fund can give you a consistent return at a much lower risk than the market. Um, our Anchor Accelerator Fund, is, um, we've delivered 17% return per annum for the last three years. Um, the guys who manage it, are it's really risk management first before return. 
Um, so, you know, hedge funds can mean a million different things. If you can find a good risk manager and, and somebody who's going to look after money in a downturn, um, that certainly does play a big role in terms of a, a portfolio. And interestingly enough, you know, because financial advisors um, kind of are, are, are scared to venture into that territory, many high net worth individuals that we speak to have not been shown these kind of products. Um, so often, you know, you, you can assess pretty quickly whether somebody has got an appetite for that type of product or not. But from a risk return perspective, we think quite attractive. Listed property has been terrible. Um, we, we're quite nervous about it going forward. There are some rebound opportunities. Um, but property as an asset class will remain a core in high net worth individual um, portfolios. The right property with the right client and the right lease um, gives you returns offshore and locally that you can't get in equity markets. Um, so we've actually started a, a division of our business about 18 months ago with a world quality investment um, team and independent directors. We've got Andrew Brooking, the, the CEO and founder of Java, Simon Farfield, who, who runs the Oppenheimer Property Money, uh, among others. And we're presenting high net worth individuals with individual um, specific investments in property opportunities with transparency and without all of the nonsense that comes with the gearing and management and, and issues of listed property. And really our objective here is in the offshore portfolios to have an instrument that just compounds at 8 to 12% per annum in dollars. And you can still achieve that in property at low risk, um, but buying you know, property shares have the same volatility as equity markets. This is something which will provide the exact opposite. So, you know, we'd, we'd, we'd be delighted to show you what we're doing in this space. Um, we have a huge pipeline of opportunities. And we've really only done this because um, listed property was, was starting to become a fatigued asset class. So some other key points, which kind of didn't, um, some of them are obvious, but, but they're saying um, confidentiality. Um, you know, you, you're never going to hear us mention the name of any one of our, our high net worth individuals or the guys who work with financial advisors. Um, no name dropping, um, you know, that really goes down badly. You know, we don't, you don't have to prove yourself to the high net with individual. Honesty and integrity, if that started for a moment, um, you know, you're going to get shown out the door. Get admin right. You know, the, the few clients that we've lost of, of the last eight years, I think one is about returns, 10 are from admin. Um, work with a team of people and prepare properly. Um, Succinct proposals, you know, guys don't want to see 60 pages with a conclusion at the end. Um, high net worth individuals get, uh, you know, are very busy. Cut to the chase right up the front. T tell them what you're going to um, tell them right up front. And then, you know, just also how we feel about markets, where markets are valuations at all-time highs, the highest they've been at 20 years. Um, we're nervous to go and index type stuff. We do use ETFs where relevant. Um, but as you've seen this year, it's particularly important to be in the right segment of the market. Um, concentration risk is becoming very high. Um, if you buy an S&P future at the moment, you're buying 30% in five companies. Um, so, you know, we'd like to feel that 2020s is, will become the decade of the stock pickers. Um, and obviously, we have, we have a vested interest in saying so, but that is a genuine feeling of ours. So to sum it all up, um, if you want to hunt whales, take a ranger with you. We've partnered with, you know, probably half of our big high net worth individual clients are in partnership with financial advisors, um, provide value added services, segregated portfolios are very attractive and a core service. Um, and, and we've got wonderful communications, which, which keeps, keep clients intrigued and interested. Ask for business, you might get a surprise, identify their problems and solve them and shift from a mindset of wealth creation to wealth preservation. So guys, that's, uh, I'm just one voice and there's lots of different ways to deal with these kind of clients, um, but we certainly have had some demand and questions from people as to, as to what to do about them. I think we've operated in a space where we've, we've approached it quite bravely and, um, and got some experience in it. So if you've got those type of clients, we'd be delighted to work with you and, and show you how we can add value to them.